There we go. It's all working. All right. Well, I'm going to try to be professional here. Hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, October 3rd, 2014. This week, we will be talking features on Titan. Uh, Sierra Nevada complaining to NASA. <laughs> the uh, upcoming uh, lunar eclipse on the 8th. Primordial water in the solar system and uh, dust jets from uh, 67 Chiriguri. Uh, as well as a bunch of great stories from the uh, Weekly Space Hangout crew. So we'll get to all, to the, all that. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Brian Koberlein. Dr. Koberlein? Hi. We've got Morgan Renberg. Morgan, how's it going? Hey, Fraser. Going well. And we've got Ramin Skiba. Hi. You made it the last minute. Yeah. And you got that lower third going. Discovered the lower third. You discovered yeah, the I, lower third. I think I figured it out. <laughs> right on. And now we had uh, Dave Dickinson, who you may or may not know is on walkabout. Uh, he and his wife have been traveling around the U.S. Um, just like taking pictures and uh, enjoying uh, all the scenery, and he was trying to join us from hotel wi from a hotel in Reno on their Wi-Fi, which it was is madness. So if uh, he's able to return, uh, then he'll fill us in on the uh, the upcoming lunar eclipse, and if not, then uh, then he won't. Uh, so just before we get onto the show, I just want to remind everyone that that you can get this as a podcast, so if you don't feel like you really need to uh, sit in front of your computer at exactly 12 o'clock every Friday and watch us live, you can download it onto your mobile device. Uh, just do a search for the Weekly Space Hangout uh, podcast. You can find it on iTunes, uh, and you can just download it to whatever podcatching software you most enjoy. All right, well, let's get cracking. So uh, we were going to go with Dave first, but we've lost him. Oh, there he is. And uh, I, I think we'll... We may lose him again. So, Dave, can you can you hear us? He's Our, muted. He is muted. Yes, but you're muted, Dave. He's. At, we'll let him continue battling this hotel Wi-Fi. I'm gonna I'm gonna start then with uh, <laughs> with Brian, and let's start with the uh, the the latest images that are coming from Rosetta, and give us a sort of a, an update on what's happening with Rosetta. Okay, um, Rosetta is still making a close approach, so it's still moving in. We've got a landing date, I think November 12th for the lander, but this is uh, new images from 26 kilometers away from Churiguri itself, and you can see gas and dust starting to vent from this. So I don't know if you want to pull up the image or do you want me to pull up the image? One bit. <laughs> um, it's actually four images that are roughly combined and then brightened. And you can see the surface features, but you can see this dust coming off on the back side of it. And it's a really wow. great picture because <laughs> you're seeing comets, a comet start to be active from 26 kilometers away, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the... Uh... I mean, up until now, it really looked like an asteroid, cool. partly because it was black and white, but right. partly just because of the of the structure and the features that it had on it. It looked very asteroid-like. But I, as I've been, I've been posting on Twitter, just reminding everyone: no, no, everyone, this is a comet. Right. Look yeah, at it. You definitely see that. And this is only going to get better as we go, because it is coming closer to the sun, and so it's going to become more active, and so we're going to have the front row seats. That's just terrific. It's an amazing yeah. picture. Yeah, and uh, Rosetta is is paying off as as exciting as I was expecting it was going to be. It looks like there's yeah. ice or something flying off of it in uh, in that image. Um, yeah, or maybe it's just the way the light is. It lo looks. No, no, it actually did an altitude adjustment just uh, just a couple of days ago, right? It dropped 10 mm -hmm. kilometers closer, and so these pictures are from this this closer approach now, right? Right, right. I mean, you're only 26 kilometers away, which is, you know, not really that far at all. That's pretty cool. 
So what are the We're next? Less than a marathon distance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just run, just run down through space. So, no so then, you know, for people who haven't been sort of keeping track of the mission, then on November twelfth, what's going to happen? Uh, on November twelfth, the uh, lander Philae, uh, they've they've got a target landing spot. It is going to land on. It's got. I don't know what you call a harpoon or grapples. It's got this thing that's going to latch on to the comet. And so uh, we're going to actually have a landing there if it succeeds. And, of course, you know, it's always a high-risk thing. But um, that's the plan on November 12th. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's fantastic. Very cool. I think I'm just going to stay a comet for the rest of this episode. <laughs> 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 that works. Uh, yeah. All right. So, Dave Dickinson, can you hear us? Yes, I can. You All right. Me? While the the hotel Wi-Fi, we are holding it together with it's stable bailing wire. Tell us about the upcoming eclipse. It is stable. There, yes, there is going to be two eclipses this October, and coming next Wednesday, starting with a total lunar eclipse. And the good thing is North America is going to see both the total lunar eclipse on October 8th and the partial solar eclipse for the western U.S. on October 23rd. So these are going to be kind of, these are going to be big observational events coming up. We had another total lunar eclipse on April 15th this year, so this is our second total lunar eclipse, our fourth eclipse overall. We're having four eclipses this year, which is the minimum number of eclipses you can have in one year. And this is part of the lunar tetrad that we're having two this year and two next year, all visible from North America. So this one's going to be going off Wednesday morning, and the East Coast is going to be seeing the moon set while it's in eclipse, while it's in totality. And the West Coast is going to see the entire event, uh, assuming it's clear, of course. In Hawaii, it's going to be every, the whole Pacific region from the Far East and Australia and Hawaii and Western U.S. is going to see this eclipse. It's going to be very cool from the Western U.S. because we're going to have it early in the morning towards sunrise, and it's going to be uh, something very photogenic. You'll be able to get the moon as it's eclipsed behind various objects like mountains, statues, buildings. I expect to see a lot of really good photography coming out of this and the partial solar eclipse on October 23rd as well. And so if you, if you wanted the nice evening eclipse, where would you want to live? I, I think here in the West, Western U.S., well, to see it in the evening before midnight, you'd have to be over in Japan and the Far East and uh, Hawaii. They're going to see it as an evening eclipse. We're going to see it as an early morning eclipse here. I'm probably going to be getting up about, I'm in the West, in the Pacific time zone right now, so I'm probably going to be getting up about 2 o'clock or so, and the moon will be uh, entering into the partial phases. The totality for this eclipse is just 18 minutes shorter than it was on April 15th, 61 minutes long. So I expect this to be a fairly bright red eclipse because the moon is passing through the northern part of the Earth's shadow. It's not it's not passing through the very center it's on the northern edge. So I think it's going to be a pretty April fifteenth. If the April fifteenth eclipse is any indication, it's going to be a pretty coppery bright red eclipse. Not every eclipse is the same. In nineteen ninety two, after the uh, eruption of Mount Pinatubo, there was an eclipse that the moon almost disappeared entirely when it passed into the Earth's shadow. Uh, and right now, they said that the atmosphere seemed to be relatively clear on April 15th on that eclipse. So I think we're in for a pretty uh, cherry red bright eclipse. So this will be really early Wednesday morning, you said? Wednesday morning. Uh, yes. The penumbral phases start at right around uh, 1.15 Pacific time. Uh, don't expect to see much during the penumbral phases because your penumbra is so subtle that you might see a little like light shading on the moon. But the partial phases are going to begin right around 1024 universal time, which computes to 324 specific daylight saving time in the morning. Uh, so that the real action is going to begin right around, actually, excuse me, that's when totality begins, is right around 324. So that's going to be the key time when the moon is in the Earth's shadow entirely. You'll start noticing it right around 2.15 Pacific time in the morning. You're going to notice that the, the moon's starting to get like a slight bite taken out of the southwestern corner of it. So it'll have kind of a Pac-Man-like appearance. But yeah, that's, that's coming right up. So. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, David. I know you uh, you got to keep moving, uh, keep rambling. Thank you. Uh, uh, but uh, but it was yeah, great I, I to have a blast with the I'm glad I got in here finally. 
<laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, well, well don't be a stranger. I'll try to and, join in whenever the Wi-Fi is working. Yeah, and we'll enjoy the trip, and uh, and we look forward to future reports. Thank you. All right, we'll see you later. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. Uh, so now I want to talk about uh, this strange this strange feature on Titan. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, you get the picture of that up because this is going to make no sense uh, without the picture. Uh, I'll just talk about uh, Titan a little bit. Uh, Cassini's been at Saturn now for over 10 years. Uh, and in that time, it's completed more than 200 orbits of the system. And every single time it goes around the Saturn system, it passes by Titan. And that means that Titan has been more closely observed than any other uh, non-planetary and not the moon body in the solar system. We have you know, almost uncountable uh, number of observations of Titan. And when that happens, you can imagine that we see the same areas over and over and over again. And sometimes, just like uh, on Mars, we see that areas change as time goes on. And so what we're looking at here is three radar images of the surface of Titan. And the way radar works is, is it basically makes a map of the smoothness of the terrain. And so there's really black areas that's really, really smooth. The whiter the area is, the more broken up, the rougher the terrain is. And so over the last 10 years, Cassini scientists have begun to interpret these big black areas as lakes. Now, unlike lakes here on the Earth, these are, aren't lakes of water. Uh, they're lakes of liquid methane. But just like water on the Earth, you can imagine, you know, compared to the size of a lake, its surface is very smooth. And so they reflect radar very effectively, and we see them as these big black uh, splotches on, on these maps of, of the moon. Um, and so we're kind of looking here at the shoreline of one of these lakes. And you can see in that leftmost image, the circled area is more or less blank. It's just, based, I'll call it open water, but again, it's not water, it's methane. And then in the middle, we see this suddenly, this patch of roughness crop up. And that was uh, about two years ago, back in 2012. And then here on the right, we see it again in um, images from just a few weeks ago. And this is important because had we only had that middle image, you could have easily concluded this was some sort of imaging artifact, a reflection, uh, the processing didn't work right, the chip malfunctioned for a second. These things happen all the time in space imaging. But when we have two images separated by two years of the same spot showing this, this strange feature, we can conclude with a very high level of certainty that we're looking at something real. And then the question just becomes, what is it? And we've only basically ruled out one thing. And we've ruled out the idea that the ocean or lake has evaporated enough to reveal new land. Because if you look at the edges of that shoreline in the upper right corner, they're pretty much unchanged across all three images. And had the lake evaporated enough to reveal new land, we would have seen that shoreline uh, drift inwards towards the center of the image. That didn't happen, so we don't think that we're seeing something new like that. The two best suggestions that have been put forward are that we're seeing bubbles coming up from under, uh, underneath the surface, or that we're looking at increased surface wave activity. So this could be waves breaking near the shoreline, like we have you know, on beaches all over the Earth. And you might wonder, you know, why is this happening now in 2012 and 2014, but it wasn't happening in 2007? And the answer is, is that the seasons on Titan are changing. So unlike the Earth, where the seasons change you know, over the course of a year, Seasons at the Saturn system change over a much longer cycle of about 17 years. And so Cassini, who's now just been there uh, 10 years, is starting to see summer uh, happen on Saturn and on Titan and all these other moons. And of course, we know in, in summer the temperatures get warmer. That can cause things to melt, which can cause those gas bubbles. It gets windy. Wind can drive the waves. You just see a much more active system uh, when it's warm and, and summer-like than you do when it's cold. And this could be some, uh, some of the first direct evidence of the seasonal changes on the surface of, of Titan. Uh, what about like a, some kind of iceberg or methaneberg? That hasn't been ruled out, uh, but I don't know if there's any reason to think that uh, that's what it is, because had 
there have been some sort of iceberg. You know, icebergs here on Earth, they float around with currents in the ocean. And even if currents in Titan's ocean are much weaker than they are on the Earth, and they probably are, uh, you'd have expected some movement over two years of a future like that. So they haven't ruled it out, but I think it's less favorable as opposed to something um, a little bit less mobile, like waves. Right. Well, I think then it just is another reason why we need to send our uh, our sailboat to Titan. Absolutely. Uh, we, we really, yeah. just based on these radio, uh, those radar images, we're really just making a lot of hazard hazarded guesses about what it's like down there. Uh, and we have, in, re in truth, very, very little understanding of what the surface of Titan is like, other than right where the Huygens lander uh, was, which was more or less a desert. And so we really have no idea what these oceans look like. Are they, uh, you know, meters deep or kilometers deep? We've, we've made some guesses based on some various observations, but we don't have a solid picture of of it at all. And that makes interpreting exciting things like this a lot more challenging. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm telling you. Sailboat. Let's do it. <laughs> Sandy will be the, the captain. Methane. Sailing on, yeah, sail on the methane. Sandy will be the captain. Uh, it'll work. All right, Ramin, let's talk about uh, primordial water in the solar system. Yeah, so that was a, a big story this week. Um, so I mean, I, my, my, I know a lot about uh, galaxies, dark matter, and cosmology. This is a, a different topic for me. So if if I, uh, you know, say something that sounds wrong, <laughs> please uh, correct me. Um, but uh, so there's this. So what people found there is a a study that was in um, Science magazine, and it was led by Ilsador Cleves. A uh, astronomer, or I guess astrochemist, at uh, the University of Michigan, and um, they they were doing basically a chemical analysis of of of, of water using simulations and, and models. And um, so we think uh, early on in the solar system, you have uh, gas and dust and maybe ice, um, and and. Uh, you have while the star, while the the central sun is forming, you have these sort of um, clumps of of dust and and planetesimals forming uh, throughout the system. Um, and if if you look at the beginning of a planet, it's it's sort of like a a, uh, a disk of of dust and and gas. And it's and I, from what I hear, uh, I guess the formation of a, a planetesimal disk is sort of like the beginning of a uh, of a galactic disk, which I'm more familiar mm -hmm. with. But uh, so I think at least some of the physical principles are the same. Um, in any case, people think that uh, there may be some ice there. Um, and so this is also related to uh, uh, ice on comets. So we talked about uh, Churi Guri earlier. Um, it's possible that some um, water on the Earth came from comets, and so that's why it's really important to to uh, study these uh, study these comets, like the one being studied by Rosetta. Um, so what, what it turns out is that um, some, uh, so the main result of this study is that something on the order of 30 to 50 percent of the water that's currently on Earth is primordial wa water. And, uh, and so it's as old as the solar system itself. And the way they make this argument is uh, uh, they say that a lot of this water is sort of, um, uh, it seems to have deuterium in it. And this is, uh, 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 like heavy water, where there's an, an extra nu extra neutron, and uh, apparently water with deuterium can uh, form only under extremely cold conditions, uh, and so people think that this is how. Uh, so you could have ice of this form in uh, in the early solar system, and then the question is, you know, how much of this is destroyed? Because if things get heat heated up while the, the sun is forming, you could have uh, all this, you know, ice get blown away. Uh, but apparently, uh, a lot of it uh, survives. Um, uh, let's see. So they uh, right. So, so I know, like the yeah. Go ahead. Just, like this idea that the water, the water in the solar system, right? That the one idea is that it all just came delivered by comets. The other idea is, is that it it was more like it sort of formed it as a cloud in the solar system, and out of the hydrogen and oxygen coming together and but but so this idea is that this water existed before the solar system even collapsed into the 
into the the solar nebula? Is that like? Yeah. So I think that's that's the idea that that they're arguing for. And and so yeah. So you have this basically this this gas or the, this this uh, this cloud of, of of gas and dust. And so yeah, even before the the sun was totally formed, you know, before the Earth. So you know, we're talking four and a half, five billion years. Um, this uh, this ice w was was there. And um, I guess so. What they don't know a is how. Um, well, the first thing they don't know is, is how likely our, our solar system is. You know, are are, are we in a typical system um, or sort of a, a, an anomalous one? If it's typical, then you could have um, planets with water in a lot of solar systems. And I mean, as far as we know, uh, I mean, so you, uh, in addition to the Earth, there's some uh, ice on Mars. I mean, it's it's we're not the only water uh, planet with water on it. But uh, but yeah, so the question is, how likely is this? And and also, I think this is, from what I can tell, I think this is mostly a theoretical study, and um, people can, you know, test it, it hopefully, with uh, the Alma te telescope, the Atacama, uh, what is it, the Large mil Millimeter Array, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and that's based in Chile. Uh, they're they're doing uh, taking a lot of data still. It's it's an array of telescopes from around the world. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the next year or so, they'll be able to do some more uh, observations and and potentially confirm this theory. Well, that that oxygen, I mean, all that oxygen formed in supernovae. So, could you know, could you have the during a supernova explosion when the oxygen is getting blasted out of the supernova? Could you have it mixing with the hydrogen right there and then and turning into water? I think that. It's possible, but I think it might be too hot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, one thing that's not really known is when when you have a supernova go off, how much of material actually stays there and how much of it just gets blown away. Right. So it, that's there, there's actually a lot of uncertainty there because right. I mean maybe some of the material will come back and mix together, but maybe a, a good fraction of it gets just completely yeah. blown away. And so that that's actually not that well known yet. Yeah, and then where did that water come from? So this is you know well, yeah. So it's, then it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> never it's question. questionable now. Never end. Yeah, well, I think yeah. part of it is we we know that complex chemistry can occur in dust clouds, and so we get all sorts of compounds, including water, that can form, um, per particularly on the the surface of dust and stuff. You can get kind of a catalytic effect where you can get complex chemistry. But I think the surprising thing would be if if fifty percent actually survived. You know, first of all, formed outside the solar system in cold regions, and then survived the process of planetary formation, and yeah. wasn't disassociated by the heat. That would be the surprising part. Hmm. You know, really and interesting. The physical consequence of that would mean that places like Europa have, you know, 50% of their water would be the same, have the same origin as the water here on Earth, rather than forming at different layers mm -hmm. within the solar system. Um, yeah. And that's that would be somewhat surprising, but all right. Well, let's move on. Um, so I think we've got one more story from you, Morgan, about uh, dream, was it Dream Chaser Sierra Systems? Yeah, that's right. So we talked I don't remember if it was last week or two weeks ago now about how NASA had awarded the first commercial crew transport contracts to Boeing and to SpaceX. And one of the things I mentioned during that discussion was that NASA awarded a total of $6.8 billion, about two-thirds of which went to uh, Boeing. And I mentioned at the time we didn't know whether that was because uh, NASA had more confidence in Boeing or whether they were coming in more expensive. And this past week, Sierra Nevada, who developed the Dream Chaser, which is that tiny-looking space shuttle-like thing on the tip of that picture, uh, and they're the third major competitor in this new field of commercial crew transport. And they've, they allege that they came in with the proposal much less expensive than that of Boeing's, but NASA took Boeing's proposal instead. And this is kind of a big no-no in government acquisitions. Uh, if two, two proposals come in and, and both meet the guidelines, then taking the cheaper one is basically the route that you have to take. And they're alleging that that didn't happen and that NASA was improper in their selection of these proposals. Um, and in response, NASA has told SpaceX and Boeing to stop working on uh, 
the contract milestones, et cetera, that they were recently awarded while this whole mess is sorted out, uh, pr presumably in the legal system. Uh, but that isn't slowing down uh, Sierra Nevada in also working to get their technology into space. Uh, they announced a new partnership uh, with uh, a company called Strato Rocket or something like that. Do you remember exactly what it's called, Fraser? Nope. I thought I heard you mention it at the beginning. Yeah, it's something like <laughs> that. And it, it's funded by uh, uh, a guy named Paul Allen, who, uh, <laughs> right, of course. who was the guy behind the original Spaceship One, which we all know is the first ever commercial spaceship, and now forms the technology backbone for Virgin Galactic's uh, new service that will hopefully be launching in the next couple of years. And their idea, his idea, has always been uh, not to use rockets uh, for the whole journey, but like the picture you were showing, fly up pretty high uh, in a plane and then drop off your rocket and light it from, say, 50 or 60,000 feet. And there's a t most of the Earth's atmosphere is going to be below you at that point, so you have a lot less resistance that you need to overcome, and you can you know, use a smaller, more efficient rocket. And you're going 1,000 uh, kilometers an hour already, already, which ha decreases the amount of, uh, of the lift. So it makes sense on a pile of levels, except it's complicated and tricky. But Right, and so and this is, is what Virgin Galactic will be doing uh, yeah. with their uh, Spaceship 2, and this is now what Sierra Nevada is proposing to do. And they've announced that they're more or less open for business for uh, private uh, enterprises to contract with them, either to deliver crew to the space station or to d deliver cargo into low Earth orbit. And they're going to use this hybrid system as opposed to the uh, their old proposal, which was to basically strap the Dream Chaser vertically onto an Atlas V. Uh, and Atlas Vs are expensive, and I think that they're hoping to become more cost-competitive this way. So yeah, I mean, the picture if they... that seemed so clear a couple of weeks ago yeah. with commercial transport going forward suddenly seems a lot muddier and it's going to be a while I think before it gets sorted out between these various parties. Well I mean if they've fulfilled the the requirements, the technical requirements that that NASA's put out there with their proposal and it's a pretty exciting um, <clears throat> launch platform to do that. I mean we've seen it work with with uh, with Virgin Galactic or with the the original uh, the original space, spaceship one, that should be given a shot to see if it can do the trick. And and so I'm not sure how much testing and how many you know how many safe launches they've had. That's the only problem is that both Boeing and now SpaceX have had lots of successful launches under their belt, including the, with the Dragon capsule, which is a human rated vehicle. So so I think that's the only question is just how many times they can do this test. But it sounds it sounds like that's the right call to give them a shot at at being right. a part of this of this uh, competition. And we don't know at this point uh, the veracity of these claims. Of course any company can allege anything uh, at this stage and we don't know did they really meet all of the requirements that NASA put forth or do they feel like they met the important ones? and that the rest were superfluous only to basically exclude them from the competition. And it's these kind of messy details that are going to come out uh, in the next weeks or months as uh, NASA and the legal system sort through um, the questions yeah, it here. Might, it might not look good if there's a, a you know, drawn out legal, legal proceedings and investigations and things like that. So let's hope it you know, gets sorted out sooner rather than later. Yeah, I do, but I mean, we've seen that platform work with the with the Pegasus rockets and the was it the Minotaurs? Like we've seen this aircraft launched platform get payloads to space f successfully. So this is not completely crazy. This is this is a fairly proven methodology. And so, but I've never yeah. seen you know that monster. Um, <laughs> Uh, looking uh, jet with the huge rocket in, underneath it, I, you know, that's never, that hasn't happened yet. So yeah, and it's interesting to note that you know, Sierra Nevada isn't the only company alleging this of NASA right now. SpaceX is making the same basic allegation uh, against, uh, in this case, the uh, Air Force uh, for selecting Atlas Vs over Falcon Nines. And they're making the argument that they basically inflated the rules continuously to keep the Falcon 9 out of competition with the Atlas V for government launches. And so this is, seems to be a problem that 
the government is having right now in having an open competition. For so long, there's been this handful of military contractors that have basically, you know, been the only game in town. And now that there are all of these other opportunities, I think the government is slow in reacting to changing how they procure new technology to, uh, to account for this. And this is sort of the bumpy right. road that we're traveling right now that they need to sort out because there's going to be more companies in the future, more opportunities in the future, and we want to make sure that we're getting truly the most innovative and most reliable uh, but, ideas. But it's not like they can do a just-in-time delivery for the, for the vehicles, right? You've got the situation where if SpaceX signs this, whatever, if they sign a 10 launch contract or whatever, they can go to the bank and they can say, you know, we've, we've, we've booked 10 launches with NASA, that's going to be worth this amount of money, please loan us this amount of money so that we can get these rockets built and we can deliver this to, to NASA and, and, and that all functions. And so in a perfect world, NASA would go, okay, we've got another spacecraft to launch, uh, who's got the good deal? Okay, we'll go with the SpaceX on this one. And then and or right. now, now they, have to plan, they, they have to plan quite far in advance. Yeah, they all have to plan um, so far in advance, right? So they have to yeah. get this all nailed down. But that, that's what makes this such a big deal because if you do improperly select, you're hurting the competitors, you know, five, ten years in the future. And that really puts the brakes on future innovation. So when the stakes are so high, as they are because they have to be, when you're making these, you know, 10, 20, 30 flight uh, contracts, uh, you have to get it right. And yeah. so we want to make sure that it's being done properly because the consequences of it not being done properly are, you know, more, more cost, less innovation for all of us. And, and we want to make sure that's sorted out. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So this is the, uh, this is the segment of the show now where um, I will inflict uh, some stories that have been suggested by the hardworking Weekly Space Hangout crew. And so if you're not aware of this, this is a section on Google+, Plus, a community on Google+, Plus called the WSH Crew, and these are some of the biggest fans of the Weekly Space Hangout who talk about space stories all week long, and uh, we've, call, we've pulled out some of the top stories that they've suggested that, that, missed, that slipped through our radar, and maybe we'll kind of make sure that we get a chance to, to talk about them. So uh, if you haven't already, go to Google+, Plus, do a search for the Weekly Space Hangout Crew, Join that community. It's like a family, and uh, I, we really appreciate their support and uh, and dedicated uh, enthusiasm every week. So I've got one here, which I think this is a really important story that we sort of haven't talked about yet, which is the fact that uh, the moon's largest plane is maybe not an impact crater, but it might actually be a uh, volcanic basalt formed from tectonic uh, stretching. So do you guys know what I'm talking about here? Only no. in the fog. <laughs> Only in the fog? All right, so let me, uh, I'm going to show you the picture. Yeah, so the idea, I think, here is that billions of years ago when the moon formed, it was much hotter than it is today. Uh, of course, today, you know, it's quite cold, it's solid, it's rock. And when, when it was hotter, it could have had a core kind of like the Earth did. And just like here on the Earth, where we have giant plates that float around on the core, um, these plates can move around, and when they hit each other, they create volcanoes and earthquakes and things like that. And we talked last week, or a couple weeks ago, how about this might be happening on Europa, uh, but there really is no solid evidence anywhere in the solar system that other planets or other bodies have tectonics. And yet there's no reason that they shouldn't have today. And there's no reason that they shouldn't have had them in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so the evidence here is that the uh, um, so they did a gravitational map of this volcanic region on the on the moon, and the and the original thinking is that this was a giant impact crater, and the they found structures that run in straight lines and intersect at angles similar to a rectangle, which is really hard to attribute to a collision, and is more likely could be attributed to volcanic features. And so I, the picture I put up here shows you the the area. Where this might be uh, might be happening on on the moon, so that comes from Tom Nathy, and I think that's a that was a pretty big story actually that went up. I think uh, was on it was reported in the journal Nature. So, mm -hmm. all right, let me let me hit you with another one here. Um, so another story here is um, uh, that India's 
uh, Mars Orbiter mission delivered its first global views of uh, of Mars. And, and there actually aren't a lot of spacecraft out there that deliver global views of the planet. Most of them are actually orbiting really close in. And uh, I'm going to try and dig this picture up here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Emily Lachtawalla over the Planetary Society did a great job of, of pulling together all of the spacecraft that do these, these global images. And uh, let me see if I can show you the picture here. It's just great. And, yeah, really uh, and, yeah, let me see here. Um, there we go. It just looks wonderful. Yeah, some of the best images we have of the whole planet are taken from Hubble, uh, you know, all the way back here at Earth. So seeing it you know, relatively up close like this is just beautiful. And uh, and I know that NASA just uh, has worked out a deal with the Indian ISRO to work more closely in the future to, to combine their science and and work on some of their missions together. So uh, it's it's That's nice, it's sort of welcome to the club, right? You've got the your yeah. spacecraft has arrived at Mars. Let's uh, let's interoperate and let's get some science done together. So I think that's great. Um, and that story came. Who came from? Where did that one come from? Uh, that one came from Yov Landsman on the Space Hangout crew. So let me see if I can dig up one more here, and then we'll get on to some questions here. Um, uh, let's see what else is happening. Um, <laughs> did, did anyone hear about this earwig that Curiosity found on? Uh, no. 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 No, the Curiosity drill that uh, yeah, Curiosity drilled on on Mars and found what looked like an earwig. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll share the picture if I can. Um, and then the other, well, I get that picture. What was the other part? Uh, oh, and there's been a lot of work on the Orion spacecraft, which the Space Hangout crew's been been talking about quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And they're getting quite close. Yeah, I think it's yeah. December for their first uh, launch. Uh, of of the Orion, not of the Space Launch System, which won't launch, I don't think, until 2018. Uh, but this will be good for testing uh, the heat shield re-entry. Re uh, temperatures are quite high from the orbit they're planning to come back from, and this will help show that uh, it can safely uh, return to the Earth with a large margin for safety, which is the goal of the Orion program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know that, uh, was it like two weeks ago, they were... Um, they were doing some tests. They were actually moving the the stack out of the uh, the vehicle assembly building, and you could see some pretty cool pictures of them moving it around. Mm -hmm. So, how do you how do you guys feel about sort of the like? It's strange that NASA is working on almost two different projects simultaneously. On the one hand, they're building the SLS, they're building the Orion capsule, and then on the other hand, they're investing in in outsourcing this to SpaceX, you know, the launches and even the the Dragon capsule, which mm -hmm. it's not the same vehicle, it's not the same capabilities, but you can imagine that Elon Musk has a version of the Dragon that has the same capabilities as the Orion capsule in his in his imagination, and has probably got it in a in a, a blueprint somewhere that people are working on. So so um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know how you, uh, Brian, what what do you think about sort of this? this dichotomy. Why should Windows exist when everyone can buy a Mac to do the same thing? I, I think that's kind of the same argument. You know, the more is better, competition is better. If you find um, weaknesses in one design, you can counter that with advantages in the other. And, and even though they can do about the same job, you don't want to get locked into one specific technology. That, that, that bottleneck is not something that we want now. So I think it's a great idea to have multiple approaches. And it seems like it's a priority for NASA, you know, over the next few years to pursue this. So it's right. hopefully, the, you know, they'll, I mean, I guess in the future the technology will improve. But do uh, you, yeah. but do you see, uh, like, do you think that NASA can compete against SpaceX? Well, like it's you, not a competition. That's yeah, the thing. This so. is a different level. You know, these are billion-dollar rockets as opposed to $100 million rockets. And while private industry is at the point where they can front $100 million to test the Falcon 9, uh, to test something capable of going to the moon or to Mars is, you know, an order of magnitude larger 
uh, undertaking. And at this point, we're not ready, I don't think, for corporations. There's not enough cost incentive for corporations to take right. over these very large projects that just the upfront cost is so much. And that's where the taxpayer comes in. And there aren't payloads except for what NASA needs. Right. Right. Except for when uh, Elon Musk sends a, a, a million people to Mars. D did you read that? Uh, there was a fantastic interview with, with Elon Musk in Aeon magazine. Um, hmm. uh, just like a 6,000 word, huge essay, big interview with him talking about his plans. And, and he wants to send a million people to Mars. Figures, figures that, that to really keep humanity safe, you need a million people on, living on Mars. So like a colony. Uh, yeah, yeah, a colony of a million people. We're hundreds of years away from doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. But it's, yeah, I guess it's time to get started. <laughs> Got to start somewhere. All right, so let me, let me show you this picture. And I don't know if you, this is the kind of picture that I would assume you had seen, uh, Morgan. Wait, this is the here. week? This is the, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. Nope. Oh. Okay. I'm looking at it right now. Maybe it's too wide. Hmm. Okay. I apologize. Anyway, it looks like a tiny little bug on the surface of Mars. It looks like a little, uh, like a little roly poly on the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I mean, we get these all the time, right? It's Let a rock, guess. people. It's a rock. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's not Bigfoot. They didn't find Bigfoot. They didn't find a snake. They didn't find, um, uh, yeah. And did and also did people see that uh, that sphere that was found on the mm -hmm. surface of of Mars? It was quite small. I mean, how disappointing would it be to find life on Mars and it looks like an earwig? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't look like something big and exotic. It doesn't look like something totally alien. It looks like an earwig. That's not the life I want. Really? <laughs> Better than a roach or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, so people are noting in the, in the Q&A app that I've turned off the clappy thing. I figured it out. I figured out how to remove the, uh, the little clappy app so we don't have to listen to it. Uh, I, I don't know how it worked or what it did, but for everybody who I turned it off for, I'm, you're, you're welcome. So. Um, all right. I actually don't see a lot of questions from the... Uh, um, okay, so Gavin Kingsley asks, is the Dragon Capsule actually human rated now, or are they aiming for human rating? It is not yet human rated. But it is cheese rated. Yes, I'm not sure NASA's published the, the exact guidelines they're going to expect from uh, SpaceX and Boeing and maybe Sierra Nevada for what it's going to require to be human rated. But you can imagine that that SpaceX has been trying to sort of go this direction all along. And it's a question of redundancy and um, having safety features like the ability to escape off the rocket and things like that. It's got comfy chairs and really pretty touchscreen interfaces, though. Like, what yeah. else do you need? Um, uh, okay. Asuran Baltazan says, speaking of SpaceX, space rockets and new things, I started wondering if Elon's D is actually a new rocket. So has anyone heard of Elon's D project? Elon Musk's? No? Yeah, so he tweeted about this like yesterday or the day before. He just tweeted a picture of a garage with a car sticking half out of it saying something like, the D is coming. Uh, yeah. And all signs point to it being some sort of upgraded version of the Tesla Model S, yeah. not a new rocket, sadly. Oh, okay, okay, right. That that it would be the, I guess you got the Model S, you got the Model X, the newly announced Model 3, so then that would be the next one, the next yeah. car. Or maybe not even that new, just an upgrade to the existing Model S with some of the features from these newer cars. Uh, either way, we'll know next week. Uh, Stephen Hawkins, Hawkins, no, no relation, uh, <laughs> says, I seem to have read recently that someone found evidence of plate tectonics on Mars. Now, obviously, there is evidence of volcanism on Mars. You've got the, mm -hmm. the huge volcanic shield 
mountains on on Mars. But is what do you know about evidence of plate tectonics on on Mars, Morgan? Uh, I mean, plate tectonics is the mechanism we invoke for nearly all the volcanism on Earth today. So it wouldn't be surprising to conclude that there had been tectonic activity on Mars, uh, but that activity must have ceased uh, billions of years ago because Mars is much smaller than the Earth. It's about 10% the volume of the Earth, and so it would have cooled much faster. Uh, and this is the same reason that Mars lost its atmosphere, uh, is that it cooled much more quickly than the Earth or Venus did. And so it would have kind of ground to a halt uh, billions of years ago. Right. But you could still have um, eruptions. I mean, that's sort of... It's possible, I've, I've heard, um, that, like, for example, you could get an eruption on... Uh, Olympus Mons and some of those large shield volcanoes again that they're Maybe. not they're not uh, that like, you, you like they're in the tens of millions of years old for, since their last eruption which seems fairly recent when you consider that Mars is billions of years old right? So, right, maybe so one thing eruption. that could trigger eruptions are impacts because an impact uh, into the surface you know gives a big jolt of heat uh, but there aren't a lot of big impactors left in the solar system. You know, the last big one that we know of is the one that killed the dinosaurs, uh, and that was you know 65 million years ago. And so it'd be unlikely for one of those kind of events to happen on Mars in the near future. Uh, Gavin Kingsley likes your uh, Dominion board game in the background. Oh. Morgan. <laughs> in fact, I've got mine. I could almost reach my copy of Dominion if I just uh, if I was a little more flexible. Um, all right, awesome. Okay, great. Well, why don't we wrap things up? We'll uh, we will move on. So first, I'm going to give everyone a chance to shamelessly self-promote themselves. And if they don't do a good enough job, then I will shamelessly self-promote them even more. So, Brian Coberline, how do we find out more? Uh, you can find me on briancoberline.com. You can find me on Twitter at Brian Coberline. You can find me on Google+, um, various other places here and there, and uh, daily posts. Uh, that was not good enough. Concept. So uh, I would also like to remind everyone that Brian Coberline has a Patreon campaign. You can go to uh, patreon.com slash Brian Coberline, I think. Yep. And I am aware that you just crossed the $200 a month I mark. I did, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. What do we get for that? Okay. I You get podcasts. Uh, really? Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Oh, I man. Well, let me, that let high, me so. you, yeah, let me know if you need any help with that. That's, that's so I will. I will start asking you a lot of questions about it. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, as you know, we just started uh, season eight of Astronomy Cast, so uh, at this point uh, we, I've, I, have a, I have a closet full of uh, hardware and gear that didn't work, and now I've settled on the best way to do it. So, um, Well, that's great. So if you want to contribute to Brian Coberline and help get podcasts and more cool content out of him, go to patreon.com slash Brian Coberline. All right, Morgan, how do we find out more? Well, right after this, you can find me over in the Google Plus Space community, which is not the same thing as the Weekly Space Hangout crew, but if you go to uh, plus.google.com, click Communities, find Space, uh, I'll be taking any of the questions that you might have related or not uh, in the next uh, hour or two. Uh, you can always find me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg, and you can read my ramblings at cosmicchatter.org. Fantastic. And there was you've got like a big piece of... You got something big event coming up in about a month, right? Yeah, yeah. So in about a month, I'll be fingers crossed defending for my masters. Uh, so that'll be uh, keeping me busy for now until then. Uh, good so luck. I guess wish me luck. Yeah, yeah good, good luck, master Morgan. Master, <laughs> like doctor, master. All right, that's gonna be good. <laughs> that that might right, encourage me just to stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds even better. Yeah, Rumi, where do we find out more? Uh, so I'm I'm uh, uh, my, my website is raminskeba.net where I write about um, some space stuff, also science policy issues that I'm interested in, um, and then I'm also um, I'm also on Twitter at Ramin Skiba. Um, also, if you uh, well, if you go to my blogging, find a link to my work website where uh, you can find all of my uh, UC San Diego work on galaxy clustering and cosmology and things like that. And, and what is the, what if you can talk about it, what is like the most recent paper you've worked on? Uh, so the most recent paper I've worked on is uh, looking at the, the spatial distribution of galaxies um, going out to 
uh, the past 8 billion years of cosmic time. And so it's looking at um, how bright or more massive galaxies are distributed versus fainter or uh, less massive galaxies. And um, in the, of some populations, they're, they're evolving more than others, um, and we're trying to interpret them with uh, dark matter halo models. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out how, uh, how the distribution of galaxies evolves over time. That sounds really cool. Uh, great. Okay, and once again, I'm Fraser Kane, and you can find me. Oh, I put my Twitter handle there, F. Kane. Uh, Google Plus, just slash Fraser Kane. Uh, Universe Today, check out the YouTube channel where this is going to go. Um, and uh, we will see you all next week. Oh, I guess I should tell you to go to my Patreon campaign. Yeah, <laughs> patreon.com slash universe today. You can check that out. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Check out Follow Up right now with Morgan, and he'll answer some of your questions. Go to the Weekly Space Hangout crew and join the, join the family, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Sounds good.